Kent Bazemore has returned to the Sacramento Kings, signing a one-year deal. And if you're familiar with my old Locked on Kings podcast when Bazemore was here at the end of the 2020 season, you know how big of a fan I am of his. But where does he fit into this Kings rotation? And where does Terrence Davis fit into this Kings rotation? We'll try and answer those questions right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On King. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports producer and reporter at ABC 10 News. And going back to the end of the 2019 2020 season at the trade deadline, the Sacramento Kings made a couple of moves, including a trade with the Portland Trailblazers that brought uh, both Anthony Tolliver, I believe, and Kent Bazemore to the Sacramento Kings. Now, this was the season that was abruptly stopped because of COVID, uh, and then we had the restart with the bubble. And during this time, before the season was stopped, Kent Bazemore came into Sacramento and carved himself out a pretty significant role. Suddenly, uh, he was a guy that was scoring at the highest rate that he had in years. Uh, He averaged 10.3 points per game with the Sacramento Kings over the 25 games that he played uh, in Sacramento. That's an improvement from averaging just eight points per game with the Portland Trailblazers the season before that. He was averaging just shy of nine points per game. It's the only time in the last four seasons that he has averaged double digits in scoring. And he came in, he did it off the bench with the Sacramento Kings, and he provided the Kings with a a, a new kind of energy. He and Anthony Tolliver, it was reported, or we had heard the stories that they came into Sacramento and basically expressed like, hey, we're in a playoff push here. We're here to help you guys accomplish that goal and, and get this team to the playoffs. Remember, this was, if you don't remember when the uh, the season shut down, when the COVID season shut down, it was uh, right before the Kings and the New Orleans Pelicans game. This was Zion's rookie season, I believe. And the Pelicans and the Kings were both like right in that eighth seed picture, like both very much into it. We thought that this was going to be a massive deciding game, potentially in the standings. This looked like, and the the Kings were hot at this time. They were playing significantly better basketball than they were earlier on in the season. A lot of that had to do with kind of the new look to this group. And Kent Bazemore was a major part of that. Uh, And then as we know, of course, when the bubble restarted, everything kind of fell apart for the Sacramento Kings. And unfortunately the uh, drought has continued. But when you, when you think about what Kent Bazemore was to that Kings team, and you think about what Kent Bazemore can be for this Kings team, I think it's significantly different because at the time that Kings team was in need of leadership, especially at his position, Kent Bazemore. Some say he's a small forward. Some say he's a shooting guard. He can play, both positions mainly played kind of backup small forward with the Sacramento Kings in his time here, but played a very important kind of veteran scoring rotational role. And that's a role that that team desperately needed at the time. But unfortunately, this current Kings team has more of that. Now, it's unfortunately for Bazemore, it's it's not an unfortunate thing at all for the Sacramento Kings when you think about it. Like, Kent Bazemore was very much needed to be that impactful guy. This team, I don't know if that version of Kent Bazemore is as needed. And look at what Kent Bazemore did in his last couple of seasons. The first one with the Golden State Warriors had a pretty limited role with them, although did start a handful of games. Now, this was when the Warriors were really bad, right? This was the season that Steph Curry was out with injury the entire time. Clay Thompson was out with injury the entire time. Draymond Green basically quit. Very different 
from this world championship version of the the Warriors that we saw last season. But on that team, he averaged about seven points per game, played 67 games, started in 18. After that season, he went and joined LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers and was basically a non-factor, averaging just shy, or rather just over three points per game, only played 39 games uh, for the Lakers last season, ended up actually starting in 14 of those uh, as well. So those are two situations where even though they weren't the best of situations for him and winning, he wasn't as needed on those rosters as he was or didn't have as significant of a role on those rosters as he, as he did with the Sacramento Kings at the time. So therefore, he was less impactful. And I look at and I think about, okay, Ken Bazemore is joining a Kings roster that is in need of a backup three an established backup three. They don't really have that. That's a kind of an empty spot or a, a vacant spot in their rotation right now, but they already have perimeter athletic, younger scorers that are going to be coming off the bench, whether it's going to be Kevin Herter or Malik Monk. We're not sure about that. Terrence Davis, who we're definitely going to talk about uh, in today's podcast. I do believe that Kent Bazemore still has a lot to give to a team. And I don't think in any possible way that this is a bad signing by Sacramento, quite the opposite. If you remember after that 2020 season, I was calling re-signing Kent Bazemore a significant priority, not necessarily a top priority, but a significant priority. I wanted the Kings to bring Kent Bazemore back because I thought he was going to be a significant rotational piece for that team going forward that they needed at that time. He provided a solid, consistent veteran presence. Ultimately, the Kings decided not to go in that direction. I think that was the off season, if I'm not mistaken, that yeah, after Vlade stepped down and initially the, the Bazemore trade was a Vlade move. Then general manager Monty McNair comes in. The Kings decide to go in another direction. Well, now here we are a couple off seasons later and general manager Monty McNair has gone out and grabbed Bays and brought him to Sacramento. Of course, Kent Bazemore spent a little bit of time with Mike Brown uh, when he was uh, that season that he was with the Golden State Warriors. So Brown is familiar with him as well. So, I, I like Bazemore a lot. I think he's a good locker room guy. I think he is an absolutely great piece to have on your bench in a kind of break glass in case of emergencies type thing. And what he does add that I'm most excited about is he adds another element of competition to training camp. Like we've already talked about it and I'm going can, to can continue to talk about it. The competition level in training camp, I'm expecting to be through the roof because there are a lot of guys on this roster that can have an established consistent role, but there are only so many spots, right? And we're going to really dive into this next segment when you start talking about Terrence Davis, but with Ken Bazemore specifically, you look at this Kings rotation, you look at, okay, where does he fit in? Well, it's in that backup three spot because the, the shooting guard spot is basically locked down, right? We know that it's going to be some combination of, of Herter and Monk. Like that's just the expectation. And I don't know who's starting and who's coming off the bench out of that group, but both of them, I expect to play pretty significant roles, much more significant role than I think Ken Bazemore or Terrence Davis for that matter will play for this team. Unless of course they earn it. They prove me wrong. They prove all of us wrong. They prove maybe Mike Brown and the Kings wrong going into training camp. There are a lot of rotational spots or sorry. There are a lot of players who are capable of filling that rotational spot, but there might only be one or two spots available. We're really going to dive into that uh, next segment because I think the battle between Kent Bazemore and Terrence Davis now is going to be really significant, but you could also throw Chemezi Metu in that conversation. You could throw maybe to some extent, Matthew Delavadova into that conversation, although he's a backup guard and he's the third point guard. So I don't think Matthew Delavadova, I say this with all respect. I think it's a good thing if Matthew Delavadova is not playing very often, like he might, get spot minutes and spot opportunity based off of maybe foul trouble for guards or if you need a little more defense or things like that. I don't look at Matthew Della Vadova's potential role to be as significant as what maybe Bazemore or Terrence Davis or Chemezi Metu could carve out for themselves. The competition level in training camp is going to be significant. And the addition of Kent Bazemore just adds to that. 
He's a smart player. He's a good locker room guy. Uh, he he put out on social media his excitement to return to the Sacramento Kings. He's kind of a journeyman at this point in his career. He's been with the Warriors a couple of times, with the Lakers a couple of times, with the Atlanta Hawks. This is his second stint with the Sacramento Kings, uh, with the Portland Trailblazers. Like, he has been around the league. And while I don't expect him to be as significant of a game changer as maybe I wanted him to be, for the Kings when they let him go after the, the the 2020 season. But I do think he can add something positive. And I like him. I like Ken Bazemore a lot. He's an awesome guy. I think he's going to be a good locker room leader, if nothing else, a good guy to to help hold this roster accountable. And a big question mark with him, with him, like a big question mark with this entire roster, is going to be, can he help with the team defensively while providing the offensive ability that we know he possesses. That's a question we could go down the entire list of this roster and ask, right? But coming up next, we're going to talk about Kent Bazemore, Terrence Davis. Where do they work into the rotation? How many rotational spots are really available and who has an edge, if at all? We'll talk about that after I tell you about a great sponsor of the Locked On Kings podcast. Of course, I'm telling or talking to you about Built Bar. If you haven't tried Built Bar's puffs yet, you are depriving yourself of life's greatest joys, or at least one of them. And guess what? There's a new flavor, delicious, indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. Built has done it again. Their puffs are protein-infused marshmallows. Yeah, that's a real thing. It's delicious. And now there's cookie dough chunks and chocolate poured over it. God, it's so good. It's all the joys of eating cookie dough, eating all those unhealthy, delicious treats. But these ones are actually good for you. They're only 160 calories and have a whopping 15 grams of protein in them. So run to Built.com, snag a box for you and your family. It'll be the perfect treat. Or you can do what I do, which is buy one box for your wife or your family, and then buy one box for yourself. Make sure you hide the box for yourself, though, because if they find it, they will gobble it all without you even realizing it. If you get the puffs, if you get their built granola bars, if you get just their classic built bars, whatever you do on built.com, make sure you use our promo code to save yourself some money. That's locked15 to get 15% off again on built.com. Locked15 to get 15% off. I see a lot of people when they're putting together a potential NBA rotation. They treat it more like an NFL depth chart than they do a legitimate NBA rotation. What I mean by that is they list basically players by position. So like, for example, point guard, De'Aaron Fox, uh, Davion Mitchell, and Matthew Dellavedova. Shooting guard, Kevin Herter, Malik Monk, maybe Terrence Davis, if you want to put him in that spot. Small forward, Harrison Barnes, uh, 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 Kent Bazemore, yada, 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 yada. You get what I mean. Most NBA rotations, though, even a 10-man rotation that has the starter and bench player at each position, even that's pretty uncommon. I've seen 10-man rotations before, but typically most teams have an 8-9-man to nine man rotation. I think 9 is usually the sweet spot, right? You have your 5 starters, you have your 4 bench players, usually have uh, one of your starters, most of the time multiple, but at least one of your starters on the floor at the same time. It's not like a hockey change, right, where you have five guys play together and then you swap all five of them out for another five coming in. I, you can see that from time to time, and you can see five bench players on the floor together uh, at, at one point, but typically you see a, a mixture, a balance of the two of them. A nine-man rotation is what you normally see in the NBA. So with that in mind, a 10-man rotation is very possible, and I think it's important to look at who is the essentially first string and second string player at each position for the Sacramento Kings, like point guard Fox and Mitchell, center uh, DeMontis Sabonis and Davion uh, or rather, excuse me, Rashawn Holmes uh, at the power forward position, Keegan Murray, Trey Lyles. Uh, like that, that can be up for debate. But I'm, I'm looking at this as a more than likely nine-man rotation for Mike Brown consistently. We're talking out of a consistent established role. These guys, these nine guys, unless they're hurt or for foul trouble or whatever, these nine guys will more than likely be playing in every single game or the majority of games. This is the consistent nine man rotation for the Sacramento Kings. And you look at what spots are already a lock, right? De'Aaron Fox, Kevin Herter, Harrison Barnes, Keegan Murray, Demonta Sabonis, Davion Mitchell, Malik Monk, Rashawn Holmes. That's eight. And I'm not saying that, well, I, I personally think they're locks to be in the rotation. I don't see a way that any of those eight players doesn't have a consistent role on this Kings team, unless of course they're traded. 
So that's eight out of the nine guys right there. Again, Fox, Herter, Barnes, Murray, Sabonis, Mitchell, Monk, Holmes. Eight guys. So that makes the guys competing for a rotational spot. Trey Lyles, Kent Bazemore, Terrence Davis, Chemezi Metu, Alex Len, Maneke, Akpala, Keita, Ellis, Della Vadova. There's 10 guys right there. Now, I think the Kings will have to cut one of them, if I'm not mis... Actually, that's not true, because Keita... Well, yes, they still will. I'm confused. I always get confused about how much they can take into training camp with them and how much they can leave training camp with. I believe one will have to be cut, if I'm not mistaken. One will have to be cut before they actually start their regular season games. But remember also, Nemias Keita and Keon, uh, Keon Ellis are both on uh, two-way contracts. So they're part of the team. They just have their, their limitations because of that contract. So I included them in the competition for the rotation because I do believe both could potentially carve out a role for themselves, although the chances of that right away are very, very low. So if you want to remove them from this conversation for the sake of what we're going to learn at training camp and to start next season, I'm totally okay with that. But who is that ninth man? Like if you're looking at the eight that are locks, you have your two point guards, you have your two shooting guards, you have one small forward, you have one power forward, and you have two centers. So that ninth guy, you would want more than likely to be like a three, four hybrid. But the Kings don't necessarily have that or the players that do have that don't necessarily have the NBA experience that you might want. Like that was a, that's like a Mo Harkless type role that of course, Mo Harkless is no longer on the Kings team. So who takes that role? As of right now, I think the front runner to be the ninth guy in the rotation is Trey Lyles because he played, I thought very well for the Sacramento Kings towards the end of last season after he was acquired from the Detroit Pistons in that Marvin Bagley trade. He started the remainder of last season. I don't think that's going to be the case this year. And if it is, it's only going to be, it's going to be extremely temporary because he's going to be keeping Keegan Murray's spot warm essentially as the starting four. But I have heard rumors, the possibilities of maybe Mike Brown will prefer to go with Trey Lyles, or maybe he prefers Trey Lyles at this point in time because Trey is more proven in the NBA and Keegan Murray's a rookie. Don't necessarily like that. I would rather the Kings just go with Keegan Murray right away, especially with one of the reasons why you drafted him is how good of a fit he was and how much of an NBA ready prospect he is compared to some of the others in the league who are going to get starting opportunities, albeit on bad teams. Keegan Murray, I think, can make an immediate impact on a good team as a starter, as a rookie. So regardless, I think Trey Lyles deserves playing time. I think Trey Lyles was really solid for the Kings. I think he could be a good scoring option off of the bench. He does help space the floor. So if you need to bring him in at times with Fox still on the floor or Sabonis still on the floor, he can work with the two of them. So as of right now, for me, the ninth man on this roster is Trey Lyles. Where do Kent Bazemore and Terrence, Terrence Davis stand? Like if I had to pick number 10, I think it's Terrence Davis because he's younger and... He's more of an established scorer. Like when I look at Terrence Davis, I know he can get hot. I know he can, uh, he's a streaky player. And we've seen Ken Bazemore also get going a, a couple times as well. But I think Terrence Davis is someone who theoretically fits in really well with what the Sacramento Kings are going to do on offense, period. He's a floor spacer, but he can also put the ball on the floor. I think he's a little more underrated than people give him credit for attacking the basket and actually finishing around the rim. But he is a scorer. Maybe defense is the deciding factor here. Like if Ken Bazemore comes into training camp and provides what we expect offensively, but really buys in on the defensive end and plays really well defensively, or if Terrence Davis, who showed flashes of being a decent defender, if Terrence Davis locks down defensively or locks in defensively off of the bench in training camp, maybe he plays with the second unit and guards Harrison Barnes and plays really well defensively. I don't see, personally, I don't see how Terrence Davis carves out a role for himself as a two, which I think most see as his most natural position. I think he's going to have to be an undersized three if he wants consistent playing time in Sacramento this year. Because again, Malik Monk, Kevin Herter, that spot is locked down. At least in my opinion. Is it out of the realm of possibility to believe that Terrence Davis can outperform one of those two guys? 
No, and I actually want Terrence Davis to believe going into training camp that he can and will outperform those guys and establish himself as a six man on this roster. I want him to believe that, but I think I'm a little disappointed if we go into next season and Malik Monk or Kevin Herter have a disappointing training camp to the point that Terrence Davis won the spot over them. Like I, I, the expectations for me, and I think the expectations for the Kings in acquiring them is that those two guys are going to be a major part of what the Kings do. They make a lot of sense offensively for the Kings and they're challenging them to be better defensively for the Kings as they're challenging everybody. So the shooting guard spot, I think Terrence Davis should kind of put out of mind a little bit. I think it's the backup three where his role is, how he's going to establish himself. And maybe he beats out Trey Lyles in the rotation to where he comes in and plays time at the three. And when that happens, either Keegan Murray's in the game or the Kings move Harrison Barnes to the four for some spot minutes while Terrence Davis is in the game. What about Chemezi Metu? Like, I... I feel bad because I'm a fan of Chemezi's and Chemezi has done a good job over the last couple of seasons to work himself from a two-way player to a solid player who did some good things for the Sacramento Kings last season. But I don't know where Chemezi Metu fits in at all with this rotation unless they get hurt. Like maybe Chemezi Metu could beat out Trey Lyles and get those minutes as that backup for and we know he's capable of spacing the floor, although his three-point shooting percentage is not as high as you would want it to be. But I, so I look at I look at battles in training camp, right? The big ones are like Malik Monk and 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 uh, Kevin Herter for starting two guard. Uh, I look at Trey Lyles and Chemezi Metu for backup two, or sorry, backup four. I look at Kent Bazemore and Terrence Davis for backup three. I look at Alex Len and Nemias Keita for third string, essentially center. Maybe Alex Len is the one to get cut. I like Alex Len a lot, but I don't think any of us really look at Alex Len as part of the Sacramento Kings long-term future, but he's an established NBA veteran and Nemias Keita is not. So there are a lot of things that I can't wait for about this training camp, like a lot of battles and hopefully I mean, I'm going to be able to, in theory, get some access to training camp to see some of this and get an idea with some of this. And of course, we'll have some of these questions answered during actual preseason. But I hope the Kings are nice enough to release some videos of of these individual battles that we're talking about, because Mike Brown has a tough but really fun job of putting together this rotation. And with the addition of Ter- or, uh, Kent Bazemore yesterday, it just further shows that the Kings have built a roster that is capable. I wanted the Kings to get rid of fringe talent this year. And in many ways, they have done that. There is still definitely fringe talent on this roster, but this roster is significantly more talented top to bottom. And you can make an argument for a lot of these guys that they deserve consistent playing time on a good team. And that's significant. So what do you think about the Kent Bazemore signing? What do you think about... Terrence Davis, Kent Bazemore, how they fit into the rotation, who would be your ninth man in the rotation, even your 10th man at this point in time. If I had to do 10 for me, it's Fox, Sabonis, uh, Keegan Murray, Harrison Barnes, Kevin Herter. That's my starting five as of right now. Then it's Davion Mitchell, Malik Monk, Terrence Davis, Trey Lyles, and Rashawn Holmes. That's my 10 at this point in time. That's my 10. It might change, probably will change a million times between now and training camp or now and and the start of next season, but that's my 10. So what are your 10 at this point in time? And tell me why. Let's talk about it. And of course, I appreciate all your support here on the Locked on Kings podcast. One more thing that I wanted to mention, one more thing I wanted to talk about um, is over the weekend, De'Aaron Fox, I think it was Saturday night, De'Aaron Fox uh, got married, had his wedding. And videos and, and pictures and things have been coming out from De'Aaron's wedding. Look like an absolute incredible uh, scene. And contrary to, I guess, some people's belief based off of people thinking for some reason that I don't like De'Aaron Fox, even though I have been critical of Fox, just like I'm critical of everybody on this roster. Uh, it looked like he had a phenomenal time. I wish him and his family the absolute best. Very happy for him. I, I think players who take the time necessary for their personal life is extremely important. Uh, and the amount of just people, celebrities that were here at this wedding. I mean, Bam Adebayo and uh, Jason Tatum were at the wedding. They have 
uh, history with with the Aaron Fox significant history I saw. I think I saw uh, in, in a background of a photo, Monty McNair and his family were there supporting De'Aaron Fox. I believe the Rana Dives uh, were there supporting De'Aaron Fox. Of course, uh, I think Malik Monk was a groomsman, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that's really cool to see. And then T-Pain, one of my favorite artists, T-Pain was performing at the wedding, which I thought was pretty rad too. Um, so uh, congratulations. He'll never hear this. He'll never know this. But congratulations, De'Aaron, on your wedding. Uh, congratulations to the Fox family. And uh, I'm glad that he had that special night sincerely my wedding uh, was not nearly that grand not nearly as extravagant as what the foxes put on but my wedding is a day that i wish i could replay over and over again one of my favorite days of my life one of the best days of my life uh so i hope De'Aaron has the same feelings uh and his beautiful wife they have the same feelings based off of their wedding so congratulations to the uh the fox family happy that they got that wedding going if you haven't checked out some of the pictures and the videos uh coming out of that wedding go look it up because it looked like one hell of a fun time uh and uh yeah, want to make sure I touched on that here before I wrap up. But thank you so much for your support here of the Locked On Kings podcast. As always, more content coming for you. Great guests, interviews, things like that. We're still getting through this uh, this rough, dry, barren time of the offseason, but we'll get through it together. We're one step closer every single day. We're one step closer to getting to training camp, and that's when the real, real, real fun begins. But like yesterday, as an example, the Kings... They can work their way back into the news cycle every once in a while. And I'm excited. I really am excited uh, that Kent Bazemore is back. Also, selfishly, I'm excited because I know Bazemore is a big golfer. I am as well. Bazemore works hard on his game, uh, and I need his help desperately. Desperately, I need his help because my golf game is, after three years of trying really hard, or almost three years of trying really hard, it's still an absolute shambles. So, Kent Bazemore, if you're listening, please help me with my golf game. Also, I know Keegan Murray is a really, really good golfer, too. Like, he talked a little bit about how golf was one of his hobbies when we met him at his introductory press conference but apparently he's like really really good so i gotta learn a thing or two from him as well but again really appreciate your support can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of locked on kings until then my name is matt george you have been listening to the locked on kings podcast part of the locked on podcast network 